Welcome to the podcast Leadership Forum, a conversation with leaders who serve the public good. My name is Trevor Brown, and I'm privileged to serve as Dean of the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University, where we aspire to fulfill a simple phrase that Senator John Glenn used to describe what we do, inspire citizenship and develop leadership. I also have the honor of serving as the host of this conversation series, so welcome to a thoughtful and reflective conversation about public service and leadership. I'm joined today by Aaron Okerman, the president of Okerman Consulting, a government relations and public affairs firm, and the executive director of the Ohio Association of Election Officials, the association representing Ohio's election officials across 88 counties, political jurisdictions we use to organize elections here in Ohio. Throughout his career, he has been active in local, state, and federal political campaigns. He has a lot of knowledge and experience about elections, campaigns, and the way we organize and administer elections. We're going to focus our conversation here in Ohio. Each state has different laws governing elections and different systems for administering those elections. Um, so do know, as you're listening, that we're going to be talking about what applies here in Ohio. Aaron, thanks for joining me today to talk about elections and election administration. Thanks, Trevor. It is a privilege and an honor, uh, and I'm humbled to be here. Appreciate Great. the opportunity. Great. Looking forward to it. Well, let's just let's just dive right into a really, really easy one. So in, in 2016, then Ohio Secretary of State John Houston proclaimed that it was easy to vote in Ohio, but hard to cheat. So you represent Ohio's registered election officials, the election administrators who are responsible for ensuring election access and integrity. Um, what do you all do to make good on Houston's pronouncement that it's easy to vote, but but hard to cheat? Yeah, well, we take it very seriously. Both both sides of that coin are very important. We certainly have people that are, uh, I think, legitimately concerned about voter suppression. And gee, are we giving everyone the opportunity to vote that deserves the opportunity to vote here in, in our country? And we have people on the other side of that that are, I think, again, uh, justifiably certainly worried about voter fraud. And what are we doing to to lock the you know to lock the system up and lock it down and make sure that only those qualified people are voting? So I think there are you know, legitimate um, perspectives, uh, both those are legitimate perspectives that we we need to balance. Um, and that's really where where we where we do try to focus is that balance. So, you know, on the integrity side, uh, recently, we've had some major initiatives in Ohio related to cybersecurity. Uh, that has become increasingly an area of focus for us. Um, as the world changes, we need to change with it. We need to be aware of those threats. You know, we have great partnerships with uh, the Secretary of State's office, with um, federal partners at CISA and, and other organizations, the Department of State and Defense, where we, um, you know, we work really hard on on that on the cyber end. Um, and on the access side, uh, certainly we've um, argued for robust laws to allow citizens to more widely and easily participate in our system. And I think a great example is our no fault absentee voting system here in the state of Ohio, uh, the 28 days of early voting that we enjoy, uh, the ability to vote uh, a ballot by mail um, in a very easy um, fashion as well. Um, I think those are, you know, that's probably a really good example of uh, an initiative that we led way back in 2006 to really make it easier easier to vote. So when you say we, I want to make sure we unpack that because because we could be you, the Ohio Association elected officials, could be the Secretary of State, could be the legislature. And I guess the way I'll ask this is just sticking right now with access and integrity. What, what do you have, what do you and your role as an election administrator or the association representing it have more control over? What's what's in the hands of policymakers like the legislature and the secretary of state and what's in your hands as an election administrator? What tools do you have to, to influence both access and in, integrity? Yeah, that's a great question, Trevor, and one we get frequently. I mean, we we fully understand as election administrators that we are the executive side of the equation here. We are the executive part of government. And so to a very large degree, you know, we can only implement and administer what the legislature in this, in this instance, you know, largely a state legislature tells us we could do. Um, certainly there are some rules that um, have been driven by Congress and, and trickle down to the states. And certainly there are is, is a, a little bit of discretion at the local level as well on the policy side, but largely it's our state legislature that dictates how we vote in Ohio. You alluded at the top of the show that, you know, we we do have these kind of 50 laboratories of democracy, as we call them. Um, Congress has largely left it up to the states to figure out um, how they want to do their own election system. So, yeah, 
Um, but within that framework, we're very passionate um, in our advocacy work. Um, we are not shy about sharing our thoughts with the legislature on different pieces of legislation that they're contemplating and how they're going to impact the election system. Um, certainly, you know, we don't want to overstep our bounds, but if we see a bill that we think is is going to negatively impact voters um, or the integrity of our elections process, we're going to speak up about that. If we see a piece of legislation moving through that we think is going to uh, promote those areas of of access and integrity, then we'll certainly get out front and, and share our thoughts about that as well. I want to I want to pick up on so many of the things you just said. I will get to laboratories of democracy in a minute. Um, and, and see how Ohio ranks relative to the other 49 states. But, but just um, because so many of our, our, our audience will be interested, I think, in the, in, the, in the processes by which an administrative entity, an election official, can influence the policymaking process. So you just said a moment ago that if you see a bill, you might you know, say, hey, we, we, we feel this way or that way. And, and you are a professional lobbyist. So maybe talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, what is that firewall between, hey, we are the creatures of the state, um, you know, the state government creates us and, and we have to respond to our political overseers versus, oh no, we're gonna try and influence the policymaking process to uphold the values that we think are, are critical or not uphold it, sorry, influence that, that process. How, how does that work for you? Yeah, well, I, let me say from the outset, because I do think it's worth noting, we are 100% bipartisan in the way we are structured. Um, so that reflects our membership. Our, our members are 100% bipartisan. And I don't want to assume that everyone in the audience understands, but in Ohio, boards of elections are two Republicans and two Democrats that oversee our elections in every county. They hire professional staff um, at the top level, at the executive level. That is a director and a deputy director. Again, one Republican, one Democrat. We get so bipartisan in the way we do things that if the chairman of the board or the chairperson of the board is a Republican, the executive director of that agency is going to be a Democrat. Uh, if you walk into the Franklin County Board of Elections here in Columbus and you you want to register to vote and you walk up to the front desk, you're going to be greeted by a Republican and a Democrat that, that are going to share that responsibility. So our association is a reflection of that. Um, and the reason I really mention in this context is because when we go to the legislature um, with our thoughts about a bill, we always do so in a bipartisan fashion. We want to make sure that we're not coming to them and promoting a certain bill or or uh, proposed law because it's going to benefit one political party or the other. Um, in fact, we really try very hard to sh shy away from that. Um, you know, we're we're there just to talk about its impacts from an administrative process, from an executive process, the potential impact it might have on our voters. But we always do so in a bipartisan fashion. So yeah, we're again we're we're I would say aggressive on that. Um, over the 20 or so years that I've worked with the association, we've we've really kind of made it a mantra and we've said, look, if the legislature passes a bad election bill, um, a, a bill that's bad in our opinion, uh, and we haven't said any anything um, about it, then, you know, shame on us. I mean, if they want to pass a bad bill and we've told them, then, you know, shame on them. But if, if we're not being proactive here and getting out front on these things, then we're just going to have to sit back and take it. And, and we just didn't want to do that. Um, especially after everything that transpired in 2000 and the, the radical changes that that came into the election system back then, we just said um, kind of culturally, we're, we're not going to be shy about sharing our opinion. We're going to let the chips fall where they may. All that being said, again, once the legislature has passed their bill and the governor has signed it, you're not going to hear us fuss and, and complain about it. We're going to go out and do the, the job that the state has given us to do. A uh, great example is this August election. We can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of our our philosophy. Great. No, thank you for sharing that. I think it's helpful to understand that's a tricky space to be in where you're your advocate in some contexts and implementer in, in another. So you mentioned the laboratories of democracy. The, the 50 states do this, this differently and, and different laws in place and different structures. How does, uh, let, let's take integrity first and then access second. How, how does Ohio rank or stack up to other states on, on this? Well, in my humble and unbiased opinion, I think we have the best, the best system in the country and the best election officials in the country. Um, in all seriousness, uh, you know, when you look, we we really were, I mean, we we literally blazed the trail when it comes to cybersecurity. Secretary LaRose back in 2018 uh, made it really one of his uh, priorities of his administration in his first term to, to get out front on this issue. Many, many other states uh, have looked and said, what did Ohio do? And how do we do it well? 
you know, where, where maybe can they learn from some of the mistakes we made, but at the end of the day, you know, we were very forward thinking in that, um, and on access as well. I mean, we, we were one of those states, an early adopter of this no fault absentee voting method, which really just means that you're expanding access well beyond election day. Um, and so I think we're, you know, top 10 in the country as far as how many days and hours we we offer up um, for our citizens to vote. And we're, again, justifiably, I think, proud of that. So I think we're leaders in, in both aspects of that. And, um, you know, we've been, again, very intentional. That's been uh, not an accident. That's been the work of a lot of us on the elections uh, field locally, certainly partnering with our legislature and our secretaries of state over the years to to be very intentional about uh to try and do both of those and, and be national leaders in both of those. Well, you, you've, you've sort of answered what was going to be my, my last question in this space, which is, is there a trade-off between the two? And you, you've said they're not. And, and I, I did a little digging around just before our, our talk today, just so I was well prepared as well as I could be. Um, and I found a, a heritage, uh, the Heritage Foundation has an ongoing assessment of um, uh, voting integrity. And to your, to your credit, uh, we're in the top 10. Uh, tenant according to their um, their, their um, scale, and we get high marks for voter ID implementation and uh, restrictions on vote harvesting and the access of election observers, uh, but low marks according to their scale for the verification of citizenship and absentee ballot management, um, and then kind of middling for accuracy of our voter list. So they have a set of criteria. Then I'll let those sink in as I pose this question. Then I found another study looking at access. Um, the, the, there's a, a cost of voting index that a, a major university, a nonpartisan study of investments a resident must make in terms of time and money to vote. Um, and Oregon is number one because it's all male absentee ballot. Um, and we're we're in the bottom twenty percent. We're we're forty first now. This study, the the one I just mentioned on on access, heavily weights ease of registration to vote and availability of of early voting, both in person and by mail. And the study draws a distinction between early voting and in person absentee voting, because it can be limited by counties' offices rather than to, to numerous polling sites. So I think here in Ohio, if you're gonna absentee, you can only go to a county office. Is that is that correct? That is correct, yeah. We are limited to one location. Uh, and I guess technically speaking, legally speaking, it doesn't have to be your board of elections office in the vast majority of counties. It is the board of elections office. Okay. But okay. Uh, we, like Delaware County, for example, actually at one point had a, uh, Move their early vote center down to southern Delaware County. Their board office is a, a little further north. Um, they wanted to kind of move it closer to the population of uh, of the of the uh, citizens there in Delaware County. So it doesn't have to be at the board of elections necessarily, but frequently it is. But yeah. it's one look. Yeah, and so the, the, my my final question again, you gave an answer to it, but now that you've heard this, I wonder to just go a little deeper, right? I mean, so as I read this, it. It, it sort of framed, there were two different, and, and academics can come up with all sorts of different ways to measure things. And I haven't forwarded this to you in advance, so I put you on the spot. Um, but, you know, the sort of the, the, the result I saw was, wow, it, you can go really, really high on integrity and make it, you know, just lock solid safe and, and give people great confidence, or you can, can make it really, really accessible. Um, and that was sort of the way I read these two studies, but, but I heard you just moments ago say, no, you, you can have both. Um, and to that end, just a highlight again, what in your mind are the critical boths? Like what are the things that need to be in place to assure people that, yeah, voting is easy to do and accessible, but you can be really, really sure that your vote is safe and, and will be counted in, the, in a fair way. Yeah, and we probably don't have enough time to go into like all of the ways that I, I really firmly believe we do it well in Ohio. But um, again, I think 28 days is just a very generous uh, period for people to vote. Uh, and again, you always have the option of doing it by mail, um, which again, very, very convenient way of, of voting. So on the access side, I think we do a really good job. Definitely there are ways I think we could improve. One of the things we've talked to the legislature about is allowing people to request their ballot online. Uh -huh. um, ballot online. That's something that we don't have. We we have online voter registration, again, a very good pro-voter convenient um, uh, thing that we offer to our voters, but we 
if you want to request an absentee ballot, you got to go through this pretty cumbersome uh, back and forth, you know, using the mail system to, to get your ballot requested. Um, but, but that's, you know, I think that's kind of a, a one-off um, on the, and so I just think we do, we've been very intentional. We've been very thoughtful about how we're creating this, this access. Yep. Um, we're, we're pretty good about, you know, still having a good number of voting locations on election day. Typically you're going to get, you know, 50 plus percent that are, they're going to vote on election day with the exception maybe of, you know, the pandemic voting. We saw that people that's still very popular. Um, so we, we maintain a very robust election day uh, network of, of polling locations so that people have access to those and, and can vote if that's the way they choose to do so. Um, on, again, on the, on the security side, you know, there are lots of other things. I mean, starting at the very top with this bipartisan oversight of our elections, I, I think people should really take a lot of comfort uh, from that. And again, I don't want to, you know, criticize other states or, or talk bad about other states, but we, we honestly, we look around at, at some of our uh, neighbors where, you know, the system is inherently political because, you know, they've elected um, mm -hmm. someone at the county level to maybe administer their, their election system on a, on a partisan basis, or they have a board of supervisors that's, you know, three individuals, two from one party, one from the other, three from one party, zero from the other, um, and, and, and again, not that they can't make that work, but we just, it's so inherent in our, it's grained in our yep. election DNA to have this bipartisan oversight. We just feel very passionately and strongly about that. Uh, I talked a little bit about cybersecurity, but we've done uh, physical hardening of our offices as well. Uh, it might surprise uh, some of your listeners to know that, you know, we really, uh, our ballots, our election equipment is really very much locked down at the Board of Elections office. I always use this example um, to get to the very sensitive areas of a board of election, we have uh, double, it's double locked and there's a Republican key and there's a Democrat key. <laughs> um, and so I always say, you know, if you've seen like the hunt for red October, you know, that scene where they have to both put the key in to get right. the, launch the nuclear, you know, weapons, um, you know, you have to kind of put them both in at the same time and turn them. That's what it's like to get into a board yeah. of elections. It's just the various. So I always say it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, rig an election in Ohio as it is to start a nuclear war, apparently. <laughs> so good. Well, good. That's good on both counts. <laughs> yeah. So those are just a couple examples of ways. No, that thank you. Thank you for going deep on that. Let's, let's talk. You mentioned earlier, we got a special election again, just for listeners. We're in Ohio. It doesn't mean you have a special election in your, your world whenever you're listening to this. But uh, on August 6th, uh, we're going we're gonna to hold a, a special election here. And I'll just start by asking, why, why in Ohio do we, we have special elections? Why do we need them? Why can't we just run these votes during the, the general election? And just to clarify, August 8th is the day. August of our... 8th, sorry. Yeah, I just misread. Oh. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, that's okay. I don't want people showing up on a Sunday to vote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the heck everyone is. Um, yeah, we, uh, so again, I will give uh, my my opinion. I guess that's why I'm on here representing local election officials. You know, our opinion is that special elections really aren't necessary, that uh, we've advocated for a long time that, that we just kind of get rid of them, that we go to a more normalized elections calendar of voting every May, and voting every November, um, and that's sufficient, and that we can do our business um, in two days here, uh, as far as anything that we want to put before the voters, whether it be candidates, issues, uh, you know, whatever it might be, um, because we've historically seen that, you know, we used to have a February special election, we advocated with the legislature, again, kind of going back to our first conversation, that they mm -hmm. get rid of that. Did. Uh, we went back, um, you know, a few years later and said, all right, let's take care of these August elections. We, we again, continue to see that they're not necessary. They're costly. Um, the yeah, how much does it, how much does it cost to run an election? Yeah, it's, it's all, um, it's, you know, statewide, it's going to cost, you know, 16, $20 million probably yeah. to, to run a statewide election. Um, and, you know, all the costs are sunk. Uh, if you're in, if you're voting in August or you're voting in November, you got to staff the polls, you got to yeah. buy the ballot everything that you, you're doing um and again if you're only getting seven or eight percent of the people or ten percent of the people turning out yeah. um you know per vote as we like to calculate it that's uh, extremely more expensive than if you got 50 60 70 percent of the people turning out so you know again that's a that's an opinion um but we we've yep. advocated for uh you know again the better part of 20 years that we just moved to a more regular voting calendar so what what is the what is the, the statutory justification for for a special election why why do we have them like by law why what is the explanation for why they exist yeah historically um they were there in statute to give local political subdivisions kind of an extra bite at the apple if you will 
uh, usually they were for, um, you know, like a school levy or a park levy or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a township fire levy. Uh, and they wanted to kind of have an extra bite of the apple. They they might have gone in May and failed. They didn't want to wait to November. So they went in August and, you know, maybe it passed, maybe it didn't in August, but they could go again in November. Um, and so that's kind of historically what they were were used for. Um, you know, now um, I would argue, you know, there's been some Supreme Court cases on this. So I guess I'll, I'll talk in terms of that. You know, this August, we're having this primary for one statewide issue that the legislature put on the ballot. Uh, there were definitely some questions about legally, was that even possible, uh, given the fact that the legislature did get rid of August special elections, uh, by and large, last year. Uh, the court, the Supreme Court uh, here in Ohio, did ultimately rule that uh, the way they went about doing it through a joint resolution was was legal and acceptable. And so we're going to have an August special election. Uh, it's definitely uh, kind of a unique path uh, and a unique purpose. We haven't had an August special uh, election with a statewide issue, I think, since 1926. So it's uh, not unprecedented, but certainly a, a rare occurrence. Well, and I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you guess which uh, which way the vote's going to go on, on issue one, but certainly a momentous um, and then potentially important change to, to statute and law here. And, and again, just to be clear, we're, you know, we, in this case in particular, I do want to be very cautious. We're, we're not saying issue one is good or bad. Right. Um, you know, it is certainly unique and un unprecedented as far as the timing goes. Yep. We're not going to weigh in as election administrators into, you know, it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. Yep. I'll be up to the voters, obviously, decide we're the referee, the umpire. We count the balls and strikes. And so we don't want to be perceived as trying to sway one, per, you know, any voter one way or another. Yep. Well, um, earlier you gave us sort of a thumbnail sketch of, of how elections are organized here. The bipartisans approach, they hire staff, et cetera. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little game here with you. I'm going to read you a list. I want you to tell me which of the following is the biggest challenge for election administrators in Ohio and, and why? Um, and I may not have the complete list. So there may be something on the, that I've excluded. You can go ahead and say, well, actually, it's this. So first category is technology. Second is financing. Third is recruitment, retention, and training of staff. Fourth is recruitment, retention, and training of volunteers, special elections, legal changes, communicating with the public, and political oversight. And I list all that for our listeners to say, this is not an easy job. This is a hard, it's a hard job. But which, you know, pick one or two of those and say, well, actually, that is really, really a challenge for us. And then give us some education as to why. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to comment on those. And it, it is a good list. Uh, it's it's not comprehensive, but it's a very good list. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to comment on, uh, I think, number three, which was retention of staff um, yeah. and recruitment of staff. You know, just again, based on what you just shared, it is a very challenging job. You know, the unfortunate thing is it's a, it's, it's a thankless job. That's not unfortunate. We're okay with that. Um, the unfortunate thing is in recent years, um, not so much in Ohio, although to a certain degree, you know, you've seen like physical threats of violence against election officials. Um, yeah. You've seen this high level of skepticism and in the integrity of our elections process that has been borne out through people, you know, taking it to the extreme and, and basically, you know, uh, phys physically threatening election officials and their, and their families. Um, and that makes it very difficult, obviously, for people to want to stay in that in an already difficult job. Um, and so we've seen massive turnover. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate. We've seen massive turnover here in the state of Ohio. We lose 10 to 15% a year, you know, probably oh, wow. since. Yeah. Uh, and that's a big number. It's not an easy job. It requires uh, a lot of commitment. It requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of institutional knowledge. You really have to be in the job for four years before you even start to get settled. Uh, it, you have to go through a four-year cycle. You have to learn the differences between a presidential election and a gubernatorial election uh, and an off-year primary election uh, and, and the unique challenges of each. And so it, it requires time. It requires commitment. It retire, re requires a lot of knowledge. Uh, and to, to have that kind of brain drain is um, a huge uh, threat, a huge challenge to the to the system overall and one that we're really trying to be again, deliberate about uh, addressing and, and and trying to overcome. So I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to comment on that because well, I don't then, think- well, Let's keep going down that road. G give us a little background on the sort of the career path. Where, who, who's the typical uh, person who, who comes in to serve in an election administration role? What, what kind of background do they have? Is there a special training? I um, mean, then once they're in the role, 
what's the kind of skill set that you're looking to cultivate and develop and what's the career trajectory look like? Yeah, it's not it's not like uh, an engineer or a lawyer. There's no real career, you know, there's no real academic path that's out there uh, as far as, you know, here's how you you formally train to be an election official. Or here's where you go to school to be an election official. I'll be very candid with you in saying prior to the year 2000, it was a pretty easy job. We voted on punch cards. Our voter registration system was a bunch of uh, note cards with voters' names scribbled on them and their date of birth that we put in a filing cabinet in the back. And that was about the level of sophistication that we had. Um, as technology has come on board, as the scrutiny has increased, obviously we have gotten way more sophisticated about the way we run elections here in the state. Um, but with that sophistication, then comes challenges. You know, you do have to have be pretty tech savvy at this point. You're managing a lot of big IT systems. You have to be a lawyer. You referenced the ever-shifting legal uh, yep. dynamics you deal with, whether it's court cases or legislative changes or whatever. You almost have to be able to read the revised code, you know, like a lawyer does to understand what's going on. You have to manage your, you know, your public uh, persona or, or your public outreach. So you got to be a master of social media. Um, you need to have know how to communicate with the press. You need to know how to com communicate with your voters. You need to lead a very large team of, of volunteers and motivate them and train them. So you have to be a teacher. Um, you know, so many hats to wear. And, and really, again, no formal uh, way of doing things. Again, prior to 2000, it was largely a political appointment. And it was, hey, the, the judge's niece or the judge's nephew just graduated from high school or college and needs a job put them at the board of elections, you know, mm -hmm. and that was about the level of thought that went into it in a lot of the cases, uh, which isn't to say we had bad people doing it back then. It was just a different time. Um, we need more now, you know, candidly, we, we need really smart uh, people that are willing to work a lot of hours. Uh, I think dedication is a, is a big part of the job. Um, being willing to just kind of be away from your family during election season and, and put in 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks on a consistent basis, um, be flexible and, and learn um, there's, there's a lot of challenges and, and it's a big job. Um, and, and those are the kind of people we're, we're looking for. They can be, you know, high school educated, they'd be college educated. We have some lawyers, you know, we, we have, uh, people with really strong academic backgrounds and, and some that haven't had that uh, degree of schooling, but we'll, we'll take everyone. I think it's, uh, it's really a commitment to our democracy that we're looking for. So uh, I'm glad I want to, we're coming to a close here in a minute. I want to finish on that good inspirational thought, but, but just before we do, so a person who comes with no background in this, are they, they learning on the job? Um, are there ways to, while they're in the job, you know, get up to speed? Are there professional development opportunities? Because it does. It sounds like a tremendously dynamic and wide ranging set of skills that are required. How do you, how do you professionalize this, this group of people? Yeah, well, as you've certainly been a part of it, Trevor, we we have a, a fantastic partnership with the Ohio State University. We call it our Register Election Official Program. It is truly best of breed in the country as far as the uh, professional development, ongoing certification and skill development that we offer to our election officials here in Ohio. I mean, that is a role that we think the association can play a strong uh, part in. And so, yeah, I mean, when you come onto the job, you are you are going to be thrown in. Uh, you're going to get some basic training from our Secretary of State. You'll receive a mentor. Uh, we've That's a new program we started with mm -hmm. uh, Terry LaRose so that we can partner up kind of these new folks with some senior people that have some experience. Uh, you will, there's lots of uh, conferences and there are national organizations that do great work. Uh, the Election Center does great work as far as its its professional development program. Um, so we're we're trying to be very conscientious about this turnover. We're trying to be very conscientious about the fact that it's uh, an increasingly difficult job and provide resources and, and opportunities for people to come into the job without a lot of experience and, and grow. I mean, one of the great things that we've seen is kind of young people get into this job, uh, maybe at a, at a staff level, work their way up, and then, you know, eventually go to maybe another county, a larger county, and, and take a job as a, as a director or a senior staff person at another board. So it's uh, we're starting to create a pipeline. Um, we value that, that partnership with Ohio State to really uh, give people those opportunities. Um, so yeah, so we're 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 thinking about that. It's it's very much top of mind for us. So let's let's pull this to a close by imagining you mentioned young people. Imagine you had a room full of young people who didn't know about this career beforehand, and and you're you you want to fill that ten to fifteen percent. What's your pitch? What's the what's the call to service? I, you know, it is maybe next to military service. I, I can't think of a nobler calling if you want to serve your country. 
Uh, we have a saying, you know, once you come into elections and you start working in this world, it gets in your blood. Um, it becomes addictive in a way because you understand you are making a huge, huge difference. This is the way we've governed ourselves for almost 250 years. And you are literally front and center. You are making that happen. Uh, you know, the bad part is, unlike the public thinks, you don't work two days a year. <laughs> you know, you work a lot more than that to make this happen. Um, but man, it is it is extraordinarily rewarding. You just won't talk to an election official, not just from Ohio, but from around the country, who wouldn't say, you know, that it's it's worth it's worth it. You know, I mean, people are definitely leaving because it's getting tougher, but they they won't look back and say, gee, I regret doing that. They'll say it was a great experience and, and I'm glad I did it. And I and I contributed to to this great country of ours. So it's a it's a very noble calling. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have more people come in and, and learn about it. Well, Aaron, that, that was a great place to close. And and as you say, in reference to military service, thank you for your service. I, I'm in agreement with you. I think this is the the foundation, the bedrock of democracy is elections and they, they need to be accessible and they, they need to be trustworthy. And so thank you to you and your colleagues across the state for all the work you do, not just on two days or three if we have a special election, um, but, but all the days of the year to make, make sure that the system works well. And thanks for this conversation. Really appreciate the opportunity to do it. Thank you for all of your leadership over the years on this topic as well. Great. Right.